Uh, I have the uh, distinct honor, and Melinda, it's a tough act to follow, of introducing Simon Dudley, the CEO of Accession Events, uh, who's making his keynote debut on the big stage here at Exchange. Uh, Simon's going to be talking to you about the biggest disruption to the IT industry ever. So I've got two introductions for Simon. I got a short official one, Simon, and then I did a little digging. I think the crowd's going to enjoy the second part better. So uh, Simon's a leading authority on the power of technology to change what success in business looks like. He helps businesses understand, and business leaders understand these changes and the what the consequences might be and how to take advantage of them. He's got over 25 years in the technology business, holds numerous patents, and has a background in fields as diverse as sales, engineering, product marketing, and design. Well, that was probably nice. She said, all right, Bob, that's an interesting intro. But let me really tell you about Simon. He's been in plane crashes. He's skydived. I don't know if those two are related, Simon. He's driven around 38 states of the U.S. in a tiny car for some reason. He's been a commercial fisherman. He's exceeded 200 miles per hour on a motorcycle. I've done about 100, so I can't even imagine what 200 on a bike looks like. He's decided to take a train across Russia and China for the heck of it or for the scenery and got marooned in a minefield in the Golan Heights. And if that wasn't enough, he decided to get married again just a few short months ago. So please welcome to the stage Simon Dudley who's going to tell you all about that and more. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, sir. Well, good afternoon. Uh, thanks for staying after that introduction. That was uh, remarkable. Thanks, Bob. So, I'm going to talk to you this afternoon not about technology, right? There's lots of folks from, from all sorts of places who are going to talk about technology. Probably half the work that I do is talking about technology. I'm a kind of analyst for UC Strategies. I talk about uh, telecommunications, video conferencing. That's really my background. But one of the things that I noticed over the last 30 years is that I would get into an industry, whether it was selling WordPerfect on compact PCs, or selling laser printers that then became color printers, or any other number of things, that suddenly after a few years, the market went away. And it's one of those things that you don't necessarily need to be very bright. You just need to keep noticing these things happen. And I thought to myself, there's something to this. We need to change the way that we think. So I understand at this conference a few years ago, someone said, go and fire your sales department. Well, I've been in business nearly 30 years, and almost all of it was in sales. And actually, I do believe in the sales function. But the world of sales has not been rebuilt. Marketing has. Over the last 10 years, marketing has moved from the brochures and trade shows department to a fully integrated, closed loop, super organization that can tell you to the nearest penny how much every lead going into the organization is. And then the sales department goes, I don't know, customer wasn't in. And sales has not been reinvented. And this talk is not only a call for sales to reinvent itself, but it's also a means in which to do so. I'm not just going to tell you, you should do this. I'm going to tell you the means in which to do it. Now, I have an admission to make. As you may have guessed, I'm not actually from Austin, Texas, where I live now, originally. Uh, every Englishman, deep down, truly believes he's James Bond. It, it's a fact, people. And I have to say, I think that's particularly true of every Englishman in America, because pretty American girls always say to you, oh, I love the accent, and we all think we're Daniel Craig. Right? So the best analogy I could come up with to give you a sense of how sales and marketing have been changed is to show you a tiny little bit of James Bond, which I'll do, and then I'll talk to you about something else. We speak to a little melancholy. Grand old warship being ignominiously hauled away the scrap. The inevitability of time, don't you think? What do you see? Bloody big ship. Excuse me. Double seven. I'm your new quartermaster. You must be joking. Why? Because I'm not wearing a lab coat. Because you still have spots. My complexion is hardly relevant. 
And your confidence is. Age is no guarantee of efficiency. And youth is no guarantee of innovation. Or has it I can do more damage on my laptop sitting in my pajamas before my first cup of Earl Grey than you can do in a year in the field? Oh, so why do you need me? Every now and then a trigger has to be pulled. Or not pulled. It's hard to know which in your pajamas. Q. 007. So let's talk about what sales was. Sales was two things. It was finding customers, mainly by getting through that dreaded gatekeeper. I remember 30 years ago when I started in sales, our first job was to go to every industrial center, every industrial estate near our office, get compliment slips, find out who the buyer was. <coughs> and then once we got past the gatekeeper, our job was to sell the client a thing. And it was to turn marketing's bucket of information into a funnel where things actually came out the bottom as well. So sales used to be about opening opportunities and closing opportunities. I would argue, I do argue, I am arguing that the world has changed. That is not sales' job anymore. So let's talk about the biggest disruption ever. For everyone in the IT industry today, Cloud is the single biggest disruption in its history. Some organizations will be very successful in cloud and others will not. Some will succeed, some will fail. The idea that you can continue to do the old things and get a different result is the definition of insanity. The status quo of I'll always do, I've always done what I've I'll always do what I've always done, I'll always get what I've always had. It's not true. The cloud will replace that business model, is replacing that business model very quickly. So let's look at the things that are changing the market. By the way, this is a thing called an accession event. An accession event is also known as a black swan or an outside context event. And these are events where the success criteria in a market change. Uh, I wrote a book about this last year. You can get it on Google if you, or on Amazon if you like. My grandparents had a business that made wooden wheels. They were very successful. In 1900, they had a very successful wheelwright business in London. By 1930, they lived in abject poverty. And if you said to them in 1900, sell the business or reinvent yourself as something else, they wouldn't have believed me. After all, people have been making wooden wheels for probably 3,000 years. But cars with steel wheels and rubber tires totally redefined what the wheel was. Cloud is doing the same thing in the IT space. So firstly, most people will tell you that they build their businesses and their lives based on fact. I have to say, uh, current events would suggest that isn't true. They generally base them on emotion and then use facts to back them up. But certainly most people like the idea that facts help you make decisions. But I want to talk about two aspects of facts. The first one is that there's levels of facts. I'm not going to get into the politics because I haven't got time. That would take forever to do. But let's talk about the six levels of facts that are actually out there in the universe today. There's level one facts here represented by the pi sign. There is in, irrefutable, pi is 3.1415 something or other. There is level two facts, which are peer-reviewed, repeatable experiences. There are level three facts, whatever Wikipedia says on the topic. There are level four facts, bloke down the pub said. <laughs> level five facts, which are actually lies, and level six facts, which are Illuminati facts, which are kind of really made up. You know, we didn't go to the moon, chemtrails, that sort of thing. Now, all facts do not live in one universe. They live in multiple universes because over time they erode. So let me ask a question, actually it's rather interesting now. I've asked this question a number of times over the years. How many planets, just shout out a number, how many planets in the solar system? Is it? 
What about Planet Nine they just talked about? Planet Nine seems to be a big elliptical audience. It changes. 20 years ago, it was definitely nine because we used to have Pluto. Dinosaurs. Did they have feathers or not? Some of them did. So Jurassic Park that came out 18 months ago is out of date. And what gives you stomach ulcers? Anyone? Stress? Spicy food? Bacteria. Bacteria now, that's right. It took the medical fraternity 17 years after it had been proven to be true that actually it was a bacteria and you could clear it up with antibiotics. So be aware of that. All the decisions you make will be based, whether they really are or not, on one of those levels of facts, and they will be a fact in time. Remember, they change over time. So in the last five years in the IT industry, six major things have changed. The cloud, the cost, the competition, the clients, the conversations, and the business cycle. Other than that, it's all business as usual. So let's talk about the cloud first, right? The cloud is as big to the IT industry as the electrification of the country was 120 years ago. It fundamentally changes the way that goods and services are delivered. Because of the internet, there is no local business anymore. Your competition could come from anywhere. So could your customers. So geography is, I would argue, at a very large extent, dead. Everything, everything is trending to zero. On that graph there, I've got the cost of a genome, the cost of hard disk storage, and the cost of televisions. But pretty much everything that we have in our lives today is just dropping away in cost all the time. My last employer, our average sales price went from $40,000 a deal to $6,000 a deal in 18 months. And what did our management say? Make the sales team work harder. It doesn't work. The next thing has completely changed. I talked earlier about how we used to look for, for the gatekeepers. The gatekeepers have gone. I can find pretty much anybody, and so can you, on LinkedIn, and you can send them a direct message. Now, whether they respond is perhaps open to some debate, but certainly the gatekeepers have gone. You can't find somebody's secretary anymore. They've all become account managers. So 60% of the sales cycle happens before you're even in the deal, before the, you even know the client exists. That fundamentally changes the sales process. Your clients are changing too. Already, nearly half of your clients buying IT solutions aren't the IT department anymore. So if all, the only language you speak is IT, that's a bit of a worry, because your new clients aren't going to speak that language and don't want to hear it either. Oh, and you can't outwork the problem. If anyone turns to you in your business and says, well, we'll just work harder, whip the sales department, right? It's a standard thing to do. We need 10%, make everyone work harder. It doesn't scale. And I thought the best way of explaining how that doesn't scale is to talk about the apocryphal story of the man who invents chess and the emperor. So a man invents the game of chess and he turns around to the emperor and presents it to him and the emperor says, it's a wonderful game. I would like to buy the game from you. How much? And the inventor says, I will take one grain of rice for the first square on the chessboard, two for the second, four for the third, eight for the fourth, 16 for the fifth, ad infinitum. So what happened to the emperor? Well, by the time he got to the 17th square, there was a kilogram of rice, about 2.2 pounds of rice on a single square. By the time he got to the 28th square, it was a ton of rice per square. By the time he got to the 44th square, it was 55,000 tons. It was a Titanic's worth. Suddenly the inventor became the emperor. And what's happening in the world today is that compute power, Moore's law, Metcalfe's law, are meaning 
that the opportunity simply to do 10% better next year is going away. That's not going to work. You have to be 10x better. Because if you're not, your competition will be. And you can't work harder at what you do today and be 10x better at it. Unless you only work one day a month. And even if you did, in year two, you still run out of time. So, other than cloud changing the market, other than the cost of everything approaching zero, other than the clients being better informed than you, uh, other than not knowing who your, your clients are, everyone in the world potentially being your com competition, and most of your clients don't even speak your language, it's just normal business as usual. Well, it isn't, so let's look about what we can do about that. By the way, I normally don't put any words on my slides, but on the grounds that I hope a few of you would like to take this back to your offices and discuss it internally, I put lots of words on my slides. So if you can't read them all, hopefully you can read them in the notes. So the usual plan is this. The marketing strategy. We acquire new customers. We spam them non-stop. We have a horribly low uh, conversion ratio. And, uh, and then we make all the existing customers pay for it. Pretty standard marketing thing to do. That's not going to scale either. Another fact. I should probably put a little sign in the corner of every slide I have with what level fact this is. This is about a level three fact. This is about a Wikipedia fact. Your average salesperson lasts 22 months in a company. Your average sales manager lasts 19. Now, if you're selling products on a five-year cycle, Let's say you sell them a telephony solution, for example, just or a, or a wireless solution. You probably sell them to it once, and then in five years you ring them back and say, would you like to buy the new one? And it probably doesn't make any difference that you've cycled through three sets of salespeople in that intervening period. But if you're in a cloud world and you're selling to them every month, or even every year, cycling through your sales department does matter. The other thing to consider, and there's lots of information on this, and I'd be happy to talk about this in more detail over dinner or at the bar or you know whenever, is that the cost of acquisition in the cloud space is higher than the revenue you make from the client for about the first year. So retaining clients becomes incredibly important. And one of the things that many companies do, many resellers do, is they put their toe in the water of cloud, get about six months in, realize we're losing money hand over fist, bail out, they pull back, they go back to selling boxes to people. Well, the trouble is, you have to get through that cycle. There's an awful lot of in interesting data on the internet about this stuff, and I'd look it up. So in the modern world, we live in a world where the scattergun approach of going to approach any client who passed the missed mirror test, who happened to send a card in and talk to you, is going away. The idea that you can say, I sell to companies in the greater Phoenix or San Diego or Austin area is going away. What we need to have now with our clients is deep, not wide relationships. Cloud means that we have to move away from this whole concept of getting rich quickly. I know most of us who've actually run a reseller, and I have in a previous life many years ago, we all like the idea of getting rich quickly, but we soon find out it's get rich possibly slowly. Cloud is a very good way of getting rich long term. You actually have a business that's worth something to someone else without you in it. That's pretty compelling. So let's look at our client types. Old clients would be IT managers. You'd have a type of conversation, typically about a budget that had already been decided by somebody else. It would be a technical conversation, often around implementation issues. New clients, 40% of whom already exist, by the way, and they do claim Gartner, among others, are saying that within a few years, your average CMO will have a bigger IT budget than your IT department. 
They make budget, they don't spend somebody else's. As I once at a conference, uh, and it didn't go down very well with the audience because they were all IT managers, I said, IT managers go to work to not get fired. And they kind of laughed and said, oh yeah, that's not really very funny. But it's true because no one rings the IT department at five o'clock in the evening and says, thanks, everything worked great today. Business managers think differently, they'll create budget. The other thing that they're interested in is solving business problems. And if you're good at your job, you can go and solve their business problem. So the question you need to ask yourself is, if I'm gonna now look for a certain type of customer, who should I look for? Well, my recommendation would be, find the type of customer that you appeal to, and go and talk to them. And to do that, you need to speak their language. You need to be able to speak marketing or engineering or finance or something else because the people you'll talk to will be business people. And the IT behind it will become simply an implementation issue. ROI is far more important than a cost-based model. And in fact, from your point of view, it should be a lot more profitable. So sticky additive relationships matter. Right? One of the things I would strongly recommend is you find things to sell clients that you already have. So you have a client who bought Rutgers Wireless from you and you're going to sell them something else that adds to the network that he already has. So many people don't do that. They go and sell one thing to one client and then go through all the hassle of finding another client and sell another one thing to. As you move out of the IT department, you should become much more of a business partner for your customers and much less of a simple supplier of technology. I should point out, and I've done this because I work quite closely with a number of distribution companies, that I've said to them, to distribution, the distribution people, you're excited about the cloud, aren't you? And many of them have said, well, well, actually we think it's the existential threat that will destroy our business. Privately, they don't say that in public forums. But it's interesting to me that they're wrong. Distribution actually should be able to hold the keys to the kingdom. And the reason I say that is because manufacturers know their thing, resellers can't know everything, but distribution should be able to pat numerous different solutions together into a cohesive whole that a reseller can supply and a customer will be happy with. And customers who have relationships like that with their suppliers are going to be a lot harder to dislodge than ones who supplied a whole bunch of boxes that they've now already installed. Do we all know who this lady is? Nobody? Susan Boyle. Susan Boyle. Was she the world's greatest singer? No. Was she the world's... We'll leave it as singer. <laughs> I'm sure she's a fine lady. She was a genius in packaging. There are 10,000 pretty blonde girls who all look the same who could sing as well as her. And you don't remember any of their names, with the possible exception of Christine Aguilera. That's about it, I would guess. A few others. This lady, because she was unique, was remembered. Now, I'm not suggesting you all go and have radical surgery and end up looking like Susan Boyle, because I'm not coming back next year if you do. That's just too frightening, a room full of Susan Boyles. But, <laughs> and horror. But, her uniqueness was important. And if you can't explain to your customers why you're unique, then you're in trouble. So make certain you have a unique proposition for your clients because otherwise they can shop you. And in a cloud world, that becomes incredibly important. So here's a suggestion. One of the things that I'm always shocked that people don't do, resellers, manufacturers, distribution, everybody doesn't do, is they don't solve a problem of concern to multiple organizations. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, let me give you an example. Back in 1986, I was a fax machine salesman because I was young and strong and could lift a fax machine. 
They weighed 100 pounds each and cost $10,000. They were big things in, 10, in uh, 1986. And I could lift one into a client's site and I could put it down and the old wizened 26-year-old sales guy could go and do the actual demo. And what was interesting about that was that we would go and ask those clients after they'd done the demo and they'd normally buy two, one for each of their offices, and it would transform the way they did business. And then we would say to them, who else would benefit you if they had one of these? So of course, they would then give you the names of their top three clients and maybe their top two suppliers. And you could go away and say, hey, if you want a better relationship with Bob down the road, you should buy a fax machine. You know what, it worked incredibly well. That market went from 60,000 units a year to two million units a year in two years. The network effect of fax was incredible. Now I'm not suggesting you guys go and sell fax machines. I, I think the market is, is full. I hope it is, I don't ever want to do a fax again, and I'm sure many of us don't. But the point is, if you get involved with clients at a business level, and you help one of your clients have a closer relationship with their customers and their suppliers, then you become a cohesive part of their overall business strategy. That doesn't sound like an IT supplier anymore. That sounds like a very different job. And when your competitor comes along and knocks on the client's door and says, oh, we got the same thing that your friend's got, but it's 15% cheaper. They'll look at them and go, well, so what? That's irrelevant. They're part of our supply chain. We have a business partner, not a bloke who supplies the boxes. That needs to be thought about. Now, cultures of businesses are changing, right? The culture, and of course, that would, none of this would apply to anyone in this room, I'm certain. But in the greater scheme of IT resellers globally, many of these things are true. They're about making money now. They're about selling what you have in an imperfect market. An imperfect market is one in which the clients and the suppliers aren't necessarily aware of each other's positions or the price of the products. That's what economists call an imperfect market. Certainly the old way of doing things. Certainly in UC and in AV, keeping the magic in the box was an incredibly important part of the story. Make it as complicated as possible so the client has no idea where all the profit is. Well, that's going away. The sales cycle was all about boom and bust. You do a great big deal and then you couldn't afford to do any more business until the client paid you. Well, cloud makes all that go away. And lastly, and perhaps from a cultural point of view, the single most important aspect was that sales marketing, pre and post sales support were all siloed, different, culturally different, and seen to the client as a different thing. Salespeople would hold on to the relationship with the client, even though post-sale support probably did 10 times more contact with the client over a five-year period. In cloud world, the new model, very different, make money slowly. You are not going to do the one deal at 80 points margin and retire. I know every reseller I've ever met, including me, hoped that would happen. It didn't to me. I hadn't met. Maybe to the people it did happen to, I never met them because they did all retire. The new model is also to collaborate with clients. Remember, far more now you're dealing with business people, not IT people. I strongly recommend you overshare overshare all your information. The idea of keeping the knowledge in the little box is going away. If you don't tell the client about it, somebody else will. And that will build them a more trusted relationship. The new culture is you've got to retain your sales talent. This idea of cycling them through on a regular basis doesn't make any sense when you're selling on a monthly or quarterly or yearly basis. And remember, increasingly, now that you're selling services to business people and most of it's cloud, that's exactly what you're doing. The business, and I hope this is a positive thing, becomes more boring. The idea that the, the customer can game you at the end of the month or the end of the quarter or when they see the bead of sweat on your brow when they're 
when they're negotiating the price with you changes when the linearity of the business is at such a point where you're not sweating that you can't make payroll at the end of the quarter. And lastly, and perhaps most importantly from a cultural point of view, sales, marketing, pre and post sales support kind of merge. We've got some sort of hybrid thing going on here. The idea of sales used to be the wombat. We all heard the phrase about wombat, eats roots and leaves. That's exactly what salespeople were. They'd come in, they'd do the deal, they'd tell the customer they loved them, they'd give them a peck on the cheek, they'd close it, they'd leave. And then five years later, if they still were the company, which almost certainly they weren't, they'd go and do the same thing again. Now, the client can turn it off anytime he likes. So sales better stay engaged. And lastly, the relationships between manufacturers and distribution and sales has got to stop being so adversarial. I've worked for manufacturers for nearly 20 years and for resellers and as a reseller before and after that and in the middle somewhere. And the, the sense of everyone holds their cards to their chest and no one wants to give anything away is something that is definitely needs to be left behind in the old model. After all, however much account control you think you've got as a reseller, the person supplying the services as the back end probably has more. You have to be partners. Now one thing that my last employer did was say, we have a hundred million dollar hardware business and we're going to start doing a cloud business. And then they burnt the hardware business to the ground and then said, right, let's start the cloud business. Don't do that. That's a terrible idea. It's going to take you a long time to get your cloud business off the ground. So I know this was a Christopher Columbus, and wasn't he a lovely guy? Phrase. I mean, important, but not a very nice chap. He burnt the boats. Don't burn the boats. You can transition. It's going to be tough. It isn't the easiest transition in the world, but you can't not do it. This idea of we'll be the last hardware guy in town is irrelevant, because remember, there's no geography anymore, so there only has to be one other person in some other town anywhere in the world, and then you're probably competing against them. And I already know their name. They're called Amazon. And that's scary for any of us. So let's talk about what your sales team now actually become. In simple terms, I would recommend that you turn your sales organization into Susan Boyle. Perhaps not medically, but certainly culturally. They need to become the micro celebrities. I would use, in Austin, Texas, we have a guy who sells cars with the craziest adverts called Scott Elder. He is one of my sons, calls him his spirit animal. Every town has a bloke who sells, um, he sells mattresses, cars, or couches in some crazy way by doing mad adverts. I think every town in the country has one of those. I'm not suggesting you have to go that far. But everyone knows who that person is and doesn't know who anyone else is. Because in a world in which 60% of the sales cycle happens before you know the client exists, you need to be in a position that when they do start looking for this stuff, there you are. You are on the internet. You have a presence. There is stuff they can get hold of. Oh, and a quick tip. If your marketing department says, we've got all this interesting information and we're going to put it behind a firewall and any client who wants it has to tell us everything about themselves, yeah, give them a bit of a slap because it doesn't work. The client will simply, or the potential client will simply go to Google and find the same information somewhere else. So this idea that culturally you can turn around and say, but we've got all this great information and we must keep it secret because that's what makes us money, has become false. You need to give it all away to the extent that when the client then finds it, 
they go, well, he's a good chap. Or chap S. Such a word exists. And they'll be the one I go to. So be the thought leader. One thing that companies do, again, I'm sure no one here, but other companies do, is they go, right, well, we put up a website, and then we'll expect people to go to it. People don't go to your website. When I, my last manufacturer company I worked for, about 30% of the opportunities came through the website. Almost all of the rest of it came through social media. Because people don't go, oh, I know. I don't know anything about routers or video conferencing. I'll go to that particular manufacturer's website. They don't know to go there. So you need to be where they will be. I heard someone say recently, well, you should only use social media if your clients use social media. Well, isn't that a bit like saying, well, we'd only open the shop on a Sunday if people came to the shop on a Sunday. Well, hang on. The shop's closed on Sunday, so no one comes. That's crazy. This stuff matters, right? By 2020, all those millennials, you know the ones who sit in the office who don't do anything? Yeah? Like those people, they're half your clients in four years. They're a third of them now. A third. They're not coming to, they're not going to come to a trade show. They don't do trade shows. They don't know how to drive. <laughs> they're on the internet. If you're not there, they don't come and see you. Now, do you need to become an internet guru or a, or a social media guru? Uh, yes. In a word. I mean, really, there's no other way. But do you have to be everywhere all the time tweeting about everything? No. And he all can take a slap on the wrist. How many people are doing any kind of social media while at this event? Well, I know because I've been looking. And I can't see well enough with the lights on me. So let's pretend that not many of you put your hands up. One of the other things companies do is tell everyone how good they are. Do you know how much notice anyone takes of that? I should tell you, I'm the world's greatest lover. Now, it isn't true. Well, I don't know if it is or not. It's irrelevant, perhaps. Let's move on. But if I could have, I don't know, 100 people stand on this stage and say he is, it might mean something. So let's ask this. When you go to Amazon, what do you look for? Do you look for what the manufacturer says about their product? Or do you simply go, well, I don't buy anything that's less than four stars? And if you say, well, I don't look buy anything that's less than four stars, which is what most people do, by the way, then you have to ask, but why? All those reviews could have been bought. None of those people know anything about the products. They're members of the public. And we all know that most members of the public, other than ourselves, of course, are idiots. They're idiots. The more, most people are idiots, right? I think we could safely agree on that. But we all take notice of what other people have to say about a product. So if you're not out there getting reviews, then bad things happen. I, I'll give you a perfect example. The last few days I've been traveling around the country. I was in Enterprise Connect in Orlando, Monday, Tuesday this week. And I flew here last night, or yesterday. And uh, on the way out of Orlando, I used Uber. Perfect, lovely car, nice driver, chatted when I wanted to, didn't chat when I didn't want to. It smelled nice. The, didn't look like someone had given birth on the back seat of the, of the cab. You know, that sort of thing. It was lovely, nice experience. I get here, I get, in an, I get in a car at the airport, a taxi at the airport, with a man who hasn't slept since about 1984. <laughs> uh, but he's on a lot of anger management pills who just simply put his foot to the floor in the accelerator and just turned the wheel until we arrived here. <laughs> 23 miles and 150 miles an hour in a Prius later. And why was he allowed to do that? Because I couldn't give him, and he knew it, one star. The Uber guy, he's going to be a nice guy because he knows I can affect his business. The cab driver would have stabbed me to death if it had made him another five cents on the trip. <laughs> <laughs> and I know that because he told me. <laughs> so from your business's point of view, be very aware. And by the way, quick tip, allow people to actually have a floor in which they can 
give you a good rating. I, I read somewhere the other day, someone said, well, you should get customers to give you testimonials. Well, look, as a manufacturer's evangelist for many years, can I tell you now, quick tip, how many people ever read the testimonials? Yeah? It's an integer of less than one. No one reads those things. Oh, I, you see, you've got your brother-in-law saying nice things about you. Oh, well, I'm very interested. It doesn't matter. Right? The wisdom of groups matters. If you can get yourself a 4.9 star, actually 4.9 is not very good. That's bad because people think you've gained it. About a 4.5 is the right answer. 4.2. That means lots of people think you're impressive. So if you haven't got a, a, a system that allows people to do that, then you're in trouble. Now, make certain you're in a position that you don't get a 2.3 when they do actually give you a star rating. But I'm sure none of the organizations in here would ever do that anyway. So allow people to judge you publicly. Another idea, another thing, right? Your sales organization should be that funny. They should be the charismatic. They should be the people able to interact with a group of people in a congenial way. I mean, if they can't do that, why are they in your sales department? So here's a thought, and it's always amazed me, something I've done very, actually highly successfully, because I'm basically lazy, and I do not want to drive around the five client sites every day and try and do a demo. It doesn't scale anyway, it never did, but now it really doesn't scale. So do you know who the best salespeople in the world are? Your existing clients. And how many people use them? Well, it's an integer of less than one. As a general rule, hardly anyone uses their clients effectively. User groups, I started a little user group about 10 years ago. It's actually taken a, a life of its own now. And about 150 of the global 500 companies are members of it. And it's... It, it's kind of got beyond me. I, I feel like Mickey Mouse in, um, in The Sorcerer's Apprentice. It's just off doing its own thing now, and that's great. Do it yourselves. <coughs> A couple of other things to consider. Let's talk about evangelists, right? Now, what's an evangelist? An evangelist isn't a man who stands on a stage and tells you he's an evangelist. Because I was one of those, yeah? And you sit there and go, yeah, but he's, that company pays him to say that. Most, most people who are evangelists even admit that that's the case. A real evangelist is that bloke at the airport who sees that your Windows computer has gone blue screen of death again and then warbles in your ear for 15 minutes how you're an idiot for buying the PC and you should have bought a Mac. That's an evangelist. An evangelist is the man who sits outside Franklin's restaurant, a barbecue restaurant in Austin, Texas, for seven hours, seven hours, to get some barbecue. Quick tip, there's a lot of places in Austin, Texas you can get great barbecue. But there are people who have got no vested interest, no financial stake in making you buy a Mac or getting you to buy a Tesla. I know plenty of people who are Tesla evangelists who've never even driven a Tesla. In and out Burger, I live in, I live in Texas, I used to live in San Diego. In and Out Burger, everyone in San Diego thought In and Out Burger was great. In Austin, people who've never been to In and Out Burger will tell you it's the best burger restaurant in the world. It's all right. Other manufacturers do this, and you sit there and go, Well, I can't do that, I'm not very big. But actually, you don't need an army of evangelists, you just need what they call the thousand followers. Now, every band, every band that's going to be successful knows about this. Every author knows about this. Those organizations typically, the Rolling Stones may be bigger than you, but the far, far vast majority of organizations that do understand the thousand fanatical fans are probably in the same economic scale as your own organizations. <laughs> Build those. Have people who unprompted will go and tell other people how great you are. It's not very hard, and it's incredibly powerful. Are you going to be the next Apple as a result? Perhaps not. And Apple have probably changed it a bit. Like The iPhone is not an evangelical product for Apple. But anyone running an Apple laptop 
You just know they're going to berate you as to why you're still using Windows. And you want people to say that about your organization. So here's my call to arms. There is two types of salespeople in the world. There is the old type of salespeople, the gunslingers, the Butch Cassidy's, the guy, the guy who will tell you that he, he doesn't need Salesforce, he's not interested in CRM, he's got his little black book, he goes and sees the customer and he closes the deal. We haven't met any of those? So let's look at what a, what a gunslinger is. He's effective, but only against single targets. He's completely independent. He never even wants to show you what he's written in Salesforce. Not that typically gunslingers write anything in Salesforce. They're not team players. They make horrible managers because by their nature, they're selfish. They're often people with a special talent. Have you ever noticed how the best coaches in football are not ex-players? Because the best players don't make good coaches, partly due to head trauma, one could argue, but also because they were naturally good at it and can't understand how to coach someone else to get there. The other problem with gunslingers is they do have nasty habits, right? They've got one gun, Colt 45, bang, shoot the deal. They're pretty untrainable. They'll tell you they're untraining, but they won't actually listen to any of it. They're very loyal to themselves. How many salespeople move company? You can see it in the LinkedIn profile. The, the sales guy has moved to six companies in 10 years. Yep, I recognize that guy. There's no plan. And they can be rather gunslingerish, which means that the gun goes off in the car. <laughs> Potentially when their mum's driving. Oh, there were words on that one. Let's talk about the Navy SEALs. The Navy SEALs is what your sales organization needs to become. The Navy SEALs are interdependent. They'll take whatever weapon is required for the job, whether that's a knife or an aircraft carrier. They bring friends to every fight they go to. They're organized, their tactics change. They're very loyal. And they're normal people. I, I don't mean to, certainly I'm not belittling Navy SEALs, they're extraordinary human beings, but they started as average guys. They started as a farm boy from Iowa who went off, became a Marine, learned to become a Navy SEAL. And they scale. The problem with Navy SEALs is they're expensive and it takes a long time to train them. But for those of us who know Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, they'll know that the Bolivian Army shot Robert Redford and Paul Newman. And those guys were not very well trained. I think it's funny, in the picture, I don't even see it very well, there's a guy at the back with a rifle, I suspect that's the manager, making certain everyone else points the guns in the other direction. <laughs> you don't need a world-class sales organization, you just need a disciplined one that works as a team, who works with the rest of the organization. It's the bond Q dynamic. So the conclusions. Marketing has been reformed. I do think it's sales' turn. Doing what you've always done will be a failing strategy. You need to have deep relationships with clients because it's a much easier job to sell to them and their customers than it is to find a new client. Because you're going to sell to business people, you need to sell business problems, not supply technology to IT departments. You need to be present in the world so when the client decides he wants to find you, you're there. Don't try and work harder at the problem. You can't do it. Scale it. Train an army. Don't rely on the, the, the wildly talented individual contributor. Their days are numbered. I would say are over, really. It, it doesn't work anymore. You need to have a trained army. And, and by the way, training doesn't mean whipping them harder at the end of the quarter. And as the facts change, so much your opinion. So your call to action, find a set of unique competencies that are yours alone. Be Susan Boyle or Christine Aguilera or someone in between, but be unique. Bring your sales team into the loop and train the trainable. And if they don't want to be trained and they can't get it, then I would argue their time is up. 
build a prison so clients can find you and build a compelling solution for a group of customers. It's so much harder to be dislodged from five customers, all of whom use the same solution, than it is to be picked off individually. And then lastly, build a scaling business. And on that note, I'm going to say, remember, many a false step is made by standing still. It's an old Chinese proverb. It continues to be true. And I think it truly is time for the bar. So thank you very much. I hope you found it useful, and I will be there. Thank you, Simon. How about one nice round of more nice round of applause for Simon? Great job. More fun than driving 200 miles an hour on a motorcycle or being in a plane crash, I would imagine, Simon. Uh